Uh, so I've got a few different announcements today. Um, this coming Friday and Saturday, New Sweden Church is having a community garage sale, and it is the funds are going towards a youth room. Um, so on Friday, it's from 1 to 7, and on Saturday, it's from 10 to 4. And there is a poster at the back if you need more details on that. Um, I am going to send out around a clipboard. This is for the coffee house for the next couple months. Um, today is the last day uh, to give for the money shower for Kira Ball and Nicole Friesen. So you can, uh, Laura Lee is here, you can give it to her. Uh, next Sunday is our church wiener roast. Um, and so that will be after the service at Jay and Allie's. And we're just asking that you bring a salad, lawn chairs, and roasting sticks. And then um, on August 20th, there is a worship gathering for worship leaders and musicians at Janelle's at 9.30. And then on Tuesday, August 23rd at 10.30, we're having a baby shower for Julia and Lena, and that is at Sarah's. And hopefully it's outside. So we just ask that you bring a lawn chair for that. Is there any other announcements? Okay. Good morning and welcome. And a special welcome to all of you that are watching uh, uh, remotely. Uh, thank you for joining us as well. Um, our call to worship today comes from uh, uh, Psalms 99, the first three verses. The Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble. He is enthroned between the cherubim. Let the earth shake, the Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted above all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome inspiring name. He is holy. Let us pray. Holy Father, we thank you that we can gather in your house and worship you. We thank you for the beautiful weather that you've been giving us today. Thank you for your goodness to us. Uh, we are so richly blessed. Pray that you will be with us uh, throughout the service. Uh, be with us as we sing praises to you and be with us as the words are spoken. I pray that you will continue to watch over us and thank you for your goodness to us. Amen. Good morning. Please stand with us as we worship. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not try the sweetest frame, but only trust in Jesus' name. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy
and a good old, good, good old hymn. Scripture reading for this morning is taken from Hebrews 11:29 till chapter 12 verse 2. This is the faith chapter. By faith the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land. But when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. By faith the walls of Jericho fell after the army had marched around them for seven days. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised 
to life again. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. They were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised since God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand with us as we sing again. our eyes up to the one who can help us, the one who's great enough and big enough to be able to sustain us and give us life. And for those of you who are yawning, I see you yawning out there, uh, <laughs> give you strength for the day. And maybe some of that yawning is due to the fact that Abigail and Steph were married yesterday and they're off to uh, seek fame and fortune and a honeymoon. And so uh, we're just praying for them, for them and their lives together and yeah, that God would just bless them. Yesterday was a good day of blessing, and so that God would continue to go with them and bless them. This part of our service, we want to continue to in prayer, so 
If you have a prayer request or a praise item that you want to share with us, we have a microphone we're going to bring around to you uh, and invite you to do that so that you can, we can pray with you. Anybody want to do that? Start off this morning. Jeff. Yep, that's me, Pastor Ryan. You got it, son. Hello, there we go. There we go. Yeah, good morning. A little bit of a wake-up call last night when uh, they had the music trivia and I kind of won the category of being in the older generation, so <laughs> thank you, Sarah Tyson. I appreciate that. I never won if I got the word, though. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, we all got fed well anyway. So, uh, just a couple things. Uh, since we were here last, uh, Nadine had a results of a checkup, which uh, showed good results for the, as far as the melanoma go, malignant melanoma goes. So we graduated up to now a six month with time in between checkups, which is, which is better than always going four months. We're happy with that. And uh, her cousin, who, uh, fighting cancer and had a stroke she mm. was in the Glen Rose for months she got released from there so she's just continuing on with some uh, cancer treatments and my oldest sister had a spot returned so she's going through treatments to remember her uh, she had, uh, on her lung so we appreciate all those prayers and uh, you had something to add yeah it's hard to express that but you know you think about being diagnosed with malignant melanoma way back in 2008 to now 22 you know and I was told in 2009 to get your things in order because you won't you know, it's heading north to your organs and you won't have long to live and it, yeah it's really hard to explain but mm -hmm. you've been there through all that with us you've been you know effectively and fervently praying for us for years so that is something that is just Hard to express, but very, very much appreciated. Hmm. So, thanks. You bet. And, and to add to that too, uh, our oncologist, well, we've, out, we've outlasted him. He's retiring, so that's a yeah. good sign. But um, he shared some things too. He had given the similar people the news, like you know, get your stuff or in order six months to go. And he was at an event, and he had told these people that 15, 16 years ago. So. You know, be thankful for the developments and treatment and those kind of things as well. And uh, on a whole different note, we talked about a little bit Tuesday, we're on about perseverance. And the things that we've been persevering, us personally, us as a community, uh, different families, just, yeah, uh, just to encourage that those of you who are persevering, I, I'm thankful for you, for Randall. I know it's a tough go, some of our families here, just, but, uh, you know, the perseverance. I don't have the words right, but develops hope, and hope develops character, and uh, some of us got quite a bit of character. So, mm. Thankful for all of that. Thanks, you both. Thank you. Anyone else? Praise, prayer, Andy. Doesn't matter your age either, you can share. Yeah, uh, Janelle and I had gone a couple of weeks ago to see Jim and Betty, and uh, Jim, as you know, has prostate cancer, and so he's had his appointment, and uh, the PSA chemical level has dropped down to zero, which means that the hormone treatment is at least stopping the growth. And uh, so now I think Jim has one more, and then in about I think that test was another 10 days, <laughs> you know, mm. a series of tests. And then they said at, at his appointment that it would be, instead of seven weeks, it would be four weeks of five days a week uh, radiation treatments. And it's like three quarters of an hour to get to the hospital from where they are. So they're hoping that that would be in September rather than mm. December or November or, you know, like when the snow is there. So. Anyway, Jim was doing pretty good when you talked to him, so. Good, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Anyone else? Blaine. 
this is a, a prayer request uh, for Carol. Uh, <clears throat> if you didn't uh, get the email this morning, um, she had a, a little heart attack last night. And so uh, she's in the Red Deer Hospital. Uh, they're doing more tests. And uh, I talked to her this morning, and uh, she said she's feeling good and everything. Her blood pressure was really high last night, but now they have it back down. So she just has to go for some more tests to see what uh, what the next steps are. But she uh, said she's doing well. And so if you think of her, just uh, offer up a prayer. Thanks. Amen. Thank you, Blaine. And when you see her, would you give her our love corporately? Just tell her we're praying for her. Matthias? Um, hello. We had another pretty good week at camp. Um, uh, we actually had one of the staff females, a little prayer, uh, one of the staff females hit her head playing carburetor and mm -hmm. got concussed. So that's great. And it's her last week, so she's leaving concussed from camp. <laughs> um, no, yeah, prayers for her. And um, yeah, um, one down, we still got little staff. And so, yeah, prayers for mentally, physically. Um, yeah, not sure if this is my last Sunday here, but um, yeah, just prayers for future. I got to drive Cal and Mum to the um, West Coast. We're going to do that West Coast Trail thing. Um, yeah, and then after that, see what goes on, see what happens. Yeah, just prayers for the fam, the, uh, me and my school. I'm not doing school yet. But whatever pops up, I don't know yet. Um, but yeah, just I love coming here. It's always warming. I'm sad to leave and drive to um, Wetaskiwin all the time. I'm like, oh man, church is over. <laughs> but uh, yeah, thanks guys so much. Well, it's good to have you back. It's good uh, always to have you here. You're always welcome. Larry. Good morning. Always seems to be lots uh, going on and. In our lives, I had a birthday uh, recently that just kept on giving because we, we couldn't find a day for everybody to get together. So, right. you know, back and forth with uh, family and uh, grandchildren. And I had one of my grandchildren say to me, you know, what's it like being 77? You know, that's a lot of numbers. And I said, well, I don't know. I just got there. I have to, <laughs> have to kind of deal with that. To, you know, you think about it, and uh, these birthdays just uh, keep on coming. I suppose if we're lucky, like we all know loved ones that aren't with us anymore, and we, we don't know what lies in store. And, and then I've had a series of health problems as a result of my hernia operation that I had in the spring. and But that's getting better, and uh, so... So at least my right leg is back sort of more or less to normal and if I get the muscles in my upper left leg back to normal hopefully I can have a, a regular walking gait like I used to have and what else well we had Saskatoon season and that was really good this year and thanks to Lauren that uh, kept in touch with me about getting out to pick the berries and uh, I think I think I outpicked him about two to one again this year, but he keeps dumping Saskatoons in my bucket, so I don't know. <laughs> and uh, but fellowship uh, with people in the church and friends and neighbors around us have, have been very good. Friday night uh, uh, we had nice uh, fellowship with Dennis and Ruth, and that was wonderful. And later that night I got news that. Uh, a good friend of mine passed away at age 77, uh, my first friend that I ever had uh, when I was 10 years old. Wow. When I was 10, that was my, this was in Manitoba, my fifth school in five years, because we moved around a lot in those days. And um, I went to his wedding. He was our best man at our wedding in 1973. and. He, uh, so I'm, I'm thinking of him and 
the old King James version of John 14 comes to mind about in my father's house are many mansions and there are places for us there so I know Gordon is uh, Gordon is there now he's very faithful he was the one who first got me going to church uh, when I was 10 years old to a United Church and I see his service is going to be in a Presbyterian church so he he must have moved on from the United Church but uh, so lots of good things and and prayers and uh, and thankful for Melmo as usual so thank you thanks Larry thanks Larry the crops are looking good. The farmers are getting a little fidgety, a little anxious, and looks like a good week of sun. We can be thankful for sun and heat. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. I'll remind you that in winter. Anybody else? Last call, last chance. Okay. Friends, would you join me in praying together? Let's pray. Father, yeah, Lord, we want to lift up all these sorts of stories of our lives. Some have gone on for 20 years. Some are recent. Some are old friends passing, and, and some are the challenges we face day by day by day. Would you again show up again this week in our lives, in our day-to-day -day lives, in our coming and our going? Would you, Lord Jesus, be present to encourage and hold us and carry us? We know that it is when we are weak, you are strong in us. So help there to be enough weakness in us that you can be strong, that you can answer our prayers and you can come alongside and support us and provide for us what is needed. And so we ask for that provision for our community here, for our community out there, the, the broader community, the, the homes, the farms around this area. We, we pray your blessing on this community. We pray your favor and your blessing upon the churches in this community as well, all around us, uh, that the, the story of your goodness and, your f and faith in you goes on in pulpits throughout this community, and that we wouldn't get distracted on things that aren't important, but that we would keep the important things important as churches, Lord. We ask your blessing and your safety for us this summer as we come and go, and as the farmers start to get ready to do their work, I pray your blessing upon them. You would provide for each of them what they need to see uh, this year, your favor and your blessing to go along with us. And we pray these things in the name of God and, and in, to your glory, Father. We want to add them all to your glory because you do wondrous things in our lives. So we, we pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who is our King. Amen. Friends, it is also Giving Sunday this week, and this is when we want to stop and just pause and re remember, uh, and if you'd like to give an offering. We as a collective of C Canadian churches do ministry throughout the world, through the Middle East and North Africa. We have people now who are working in that area. Uh, we have Colleen Nanachuk in Argentina who's doing a work down there. We have work happening in Ecuador, and we sent a team off there this year. And then, of course, in Haiti, we have ongoing work and people there that we're trying to support and help and encourage. And so I want to encourage you. This is kind of just a recognition Sunday. If you'd like to give towards this work that we do together, you can put your offering. If you have a check, make it out to ECCC and then just specify in the memo who you are wanting to support if it's one of those areas. Or you just go to covchurch.ca and you can make a donation right online, right there. Take time to think about these things that, that we do together. Uh, it's important that we do that. And just remember that we do things together. And so today is a simple update, but we just want to remind us of the fact that we're doing something in the world that we couldn't do alone as a church. We're doing those things together. Friends, today we have an update. Remember that uh, Matthias was going to Bolivia? last in spring or when was it february wow that's a long time ago already but he was heading off to bolivia 
So we've asked him to give us a little bit of an update. So he's going to come up here and, and talk for a few moments about what happened. And maybe there'll be a picture or two. Matthias? So, yeah, I went to Bolivia. Oh, I can look at that one, okay. Uh, yeah, I went to Bolivia. This is my uh, crew. So the guy, like this, I'll start with the guy with the hat. That guy's Mario, and then the Tentry shirts, Sandro, the head poking out, is Rigo. Um, the girl, the female, is um, Isabel. She's uh, Ken's wife. And then there's the black dress shirt, that's Jose. Then the red shirt is... Um, Darwin, the guy up ahead is Miguel, the guy up ahead is Carlos, the guy sticking his head like this <laughs> is uh, Paul, and the guy in the white shirt just came for that day, so I don't really know much. Um, so <laughs> uh, yeah, that's where Bolivia is, so it was a, a long trip. We actually missed our flight, um, me and my dad, from Toronto. So in the first, I don't know, yeah, there it is. <laughs> so the guy, these are the main leaders that I worked with in Bolivia. There's um, far left, there's uh, Andreas. He helped at the boys' home that um, um, Ken worked at and made, basically. The guy in the middle is Ken Switzer. He's my main guy um, and his wife. Um, yeah, that was actually my dad's youth pastor when he was my age, so... That's pretty cool. And the guy on the far right, I helped with his ministry, uh, Gracia, and that's uh, Edwin. So these are just some random photos. They had, um, <clears throat> they drank about um, a two liter of Coke a day. So that's me and the boys drinking some Coke. Uh, <laughs> Monopoly was great. And each week, the boys had different chores to work on. So there's uh, Carlos on the far left cooking. I think that was Piranha. We had a Piranha, yeah, it was pretty cool. And there's Powell running. And they, we just sat in the back of a truck on the way to church every morning. No seatbelts. What is seatbelts? Um, so this is Tacove. This is, I worked on here Monday and Tuesday. This was a lot of uh, hands-on work, which I enjoyed greatly. Um, they, they heard I was learning Spanish, so they tested me and made me read a Bible book in Spanish. <laughs> the kids just looked at me like, white kid, what's he doing? <laughs> and we sang, yeah, we sang worship songs. Um, kids came every um, Tuesday after lunch or so. And yeah, we just hung out with them. There's a stray cat that came coming. There was two of them, they were twins, and I called them Toe and Beans because they had little brown nubs. They're pretty cool. Um, so this was my main project. They had a little sanctuary and on the left is before and after is on the right. So yeah, I added a fence. They, um, we hauled up a good foot of sand. I found like knives and glass in there. I was like, oh, kids playing this, that's great. Um, no, yeah, we trimmed up their tree. They had wires from the toilet um, everywhere, so we cleaned that up. Um, yeah, it was a, I felt really good after doing that, actually, it was good. And then we had a little garden too, but this is some of the work, so um, on the bottom right, that's where we hauled the dirt up. That was their little front way there. And so there's some work that we did <laughs> in the works. So um, we actually hauled a lot of the um, grass in the back of a car. That was their taxi. Um, and yeah, I installed the fence, did some grass. We had some kids in the bottom right um, help paint the fence in a rainbow color. I thought that was pretty cute. Um, we had a little garden, so that's what the little baby fence was. We made like um, pineapple, uh, pineapple things. It was a lot of regrowth. So on the top left, there's tomato seeds that we got from tomatoes, and we got peppers too. Um, this is a children's day, and this is where we got some t-shirts for them, had a big worship session. Um, this is when everything was built. And one of the kids looked behind them and was like, oh my gosh, a snake in Spanish. So on the bottom right, there's a snake that was poisonous. 
10 feet away. So that was cool. <laughs> Chopped his head off. Um, one, Wednesday we, uh, <laughs> one Wednesday, we visited an uh, IRA village. And this is like in Nowhereville. Spoke complete like Spanish. But yeah, we brought him like hot cocoa, little books about him. And this guy made a bow while I was there out of a tree and used the bark as string or rope. And he just shot arrows in the air. And everyone enjoyed it. It was great. It was fun. There was no phones. It was great. Uh, yeah, so this is top left was their old school. Uh, and then that's just their work and play area on the left. Uh, top right is their, I think, church and school, a new one. And then bottom right is the water thing. Um, we also paved or added cement to their um, area there. And um, yeah, just some works. Uh, covered their wall, so now they're using that wall on the top right and bottom left as like a painting area for the kids. They just paint in hand. It's pretty cute. I like it. This is uh, Gracia, so this is my Wednesdays and Thursdays. A lot of kids, a lot of kids. Um, this was my emotional and uh, cute thing I did during uh, Bolivia. So yeah, they loved soccer. They loved beating up white people who sucked at soccer also. And um, yeah, these kids are just amazing. And um, they were small enough that I threw them in the air. And I was terrible at saying no. So they're like, hermano Matt, throw me. And I, I was like, ah, oh, fine. But it was good. Uh, they fed me. And they loved me. And I loved them. And yeah, we just in circle. I, to I taught them a toilet take. And uh, that was pretty fun. And so they're like, Mac, Daniel. Uh, yeah, it was great. Fresh lemonade daily. Um, in the bottom right, there's the little sanctuary and right, I guess. Um, yeah, there's just a little dirt yard, and it was they loved it. They'd play soccer and dust would rise, and they'd blah, 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 blah. just yeah. Um, yeah, a few more pictures. So this was more like um, the kids would come to get some schooling help and whatnot, and um, more sanctuary pictures. They had a field close to them, and uh, yeah, they just dominated soccer there. They took turns. It was great. Uh, new, new teams and yeah, it was pretty good. Um, food was also amazing. It was chicken and rice and when they didn't want chicken and rice they had rice and chicken. <laughs> A lot of rice and um, yeah they had the spe same specific Sakura chicken place they went to every Sunday in the same spot. And, um, yeah, and they added, like, mayonnaise and ketchup to the rice, which is, it sounds weird, but it's pretty good. More food. This was better food. There's the piranha on the bottom left there. They add hot dogs to their burgers and eggs, corn on their pizza. It was pretty good. It was unique. There was cow tongue at some point. That was pretty cool. Um, I was lucky enough to last during the three and a half months that um, it was blooming season. And one of my new favorite trees is the Tobarochi tree. That's the pink one right in the middle and just bloomed. And it was like, there was all, all along the streets. And so as you drove by in the back of a pickup truck, just pink, 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 pink. It was beautiful. Just great things. A very colorful area. Um, uh, Jueves was one of the places we went to with uh, the boys. It was a little trip. Uh, during the weekend, so there's waterfalls that we went to in the middle, jumped off and had some food, big steaks, big, yeah, it was a big road trip. It was very nice. I enjoyed it. Um, <laughs> if it was a rainy day and they couldn't play soccer outdoors, they played indoors, and they, yeah, it, <laughs> it was like, hey, let's get the white kid to play the best foosball player in the house. It was, that was great. In the backyard, they had about like this big of a goalie or a goal, and you had to get in within the white. And I sucked at that. But um, yeah, they all, all had their chores. It was good. This is my last photo with them in the airport. Um, we s sat in the back of a pickup truck um, singing to uh, When I See You Again. 
uh, stupid movie, uh, Fast and Furious. But uh, yeah, they, they loved that. And um, yeah, it was my crew. I was like, oh man, it's flying again. I'm missing these guys. It sucks. Yeah. And that was my missionary trip. Thanks. Thanks for all your prayers. lot of fun. <laughs> I don't know about the piranha, but anyway, let's stand and sing. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me Would you go back? Okay. <laughs> That's honest. He said he would give it a few years before he went back. That's honest. I can respect that. But it looks like an amazing time you have. I'm glad for you. Zhao Chen. See how I handle that, Chinese? Zhao Chen was swimming alone when he became stuck in the mud. The rescuers who found Chen still stuck after four hours, were shocked to find he had a cell phone with him, wrapped in a waterproof bag. He had not used it for fear of losing face. Chen then refused to allow the rescuers to remove his pants, which meant his legs remained trapped in the mud for another seven hours. There are worse things for the proud than spending 11 hours stuck in the mud. Paul Peter reminds us that pride brings us God's opposition. God plays favorites with the humble. Now, when I was preparing this talk to, this week, I found that illustration. I thought, yeah, that's a great illustration, perfect for the point I want to make, except that it's a little too far away from me. 
If this was me, of course I'd say, well, here's my, I'd phone for help within the first three minutes. Well, maybe even two. I'd call for help. Help me. You want my pants off? Sure. Do you want my shirt off as well? Sure. What else do we need to <laughs> leave behind? Get me out of here. And I judged Xiao Chen like that. And then I thought, okay, well, and then I continued on my little merry way to prepare this talk. And then there was a text came across the family chat from my daughter, whose littlest one was going to swimming lessons, and she had a backpack, and the backpack was kind of heavy. And so she would hold it on one side, and it was very heavy, and she would walk for a while, and it was too heavy. So she'd take it off, and she'd put it on the other side she would to walk as long as she could, and then it was too heavy. And then her, finally her mom said, why don't you just put it like it's supposed to, put it on both arms? And she said, that's not what the cool kids do. And I thought, oh, oh, even at that level, it's happening. But what got even more serious was I went back to work and I thought, you know what? When I travel, like I go to meetings in, in America, I take my backpack on, on the plane because I don't want to lose my laptop and my, my notes I need. And, of course, my radio, that's highly valued, and my medication and some stuff like that. I always carry that. And lately, I've been noticing my backpack is just getting too heavy. What else can I do? How can I manage getting this to there? And I realized I do the same thing as this little girl. I put it on this side, and I walk as long as I can through the airport, and then I, get, then I put it on this side, and I walk as long as I can. And I don't want to put it on like this, because then I'll look like some guy from Podunk, wherever. <laughs> and I realized I do the same thing as my little granddaughter. And I mentioned that to try to get her some grace. But we do that, right? I mean, when, when, the, when the picture is of a Chinese man stuck in a pool with mud, well, that's a million miles away. And we would judge him and say, of course we would just not care about losing face. But when it gets close to home, all of a sudden the things start changing and we realize, oh, maybe I do start to want to look good in certain eyes. Maybe I want to look like the cool kids. Maybe it's something that I don't want to be embarrassed doing, right? There is this true sense of embarrassment or things, that, that sense of, of embarrassment that can come upon us that, that comes because of our pride, right? The heart of this deal is our pride. It was his pride. It was my granddaughter's pride. It was my pride. We have a certain image to uphold, and there's, there's a picture of pride there. Well, in the scriptures, we, we read about pride and how it can affect our lives completely, not just our backs from our backpacks or our trousers in a, in a mud pool, but it affects our insides too, our hearts. Pride has a great power in our lives or can have a great power in our lives. And so let me read to you today the story of Naaman. Naaman was a commander of the Syrian army, okay? He was a pretty big shot. He was a pretty big deal. And Syria at that time was a great and a large nation. So I'm going to read this to you, okay? I'll try to read it in a way that is dynamic and you won't go to sleep. Because chapter 5 is about 19 verses. Okay. Now, Naaman was the commander of the army, the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him, the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel. And she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. And Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means, go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets, full sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter, I am sending my servant Naaman to you, so that you may cure him of his leprosy. What a setup. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes. He said, am I God? Can I, can I kill and bring back life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me? When Elisha, the man of God, heard what the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? 
have the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, sorry, this is kind of funny. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, go, wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. Probably didn't even get off the couch. But Naaman went away angry, and he said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot, and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farfar, the, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. And Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and he dipped himself in the Jordan seven times as the man of God had told him and his flesh was restored and it became clean like, like that of a young boy. And then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, now I know that there is no God in the world except in Israel. So please accept a gift from your servant. And the prophet answered, as surely as the Lord lives whom I serve, I will not accept a thing. And even though Naaman urged him, he refused. If you will not, said Naaman, please let me, your servant, be given as much earth as a pair of mules can carry, for your servant will never again make burnt offerings and sacrifices to any other god but the Lord. But may the Lord forgive your servant for this one thing. When my master enters the temple of Rimmon to bow down, and he is leaning on my arm, and I have to bow there also, when I bow down in the temple of Rimmon, May the Lord forgive your servant for this. Go in peace, Elijah said. <laughs> what a cool story. That just about didn't happen because Elijah wouldn't get off the couch. No, that wasn't the story. The story was Naaman's pride, his heart, his struggle. Now, this is a picture. It's considered a picture in the Old Testament of salvation. Somebody who needed to be saved and salvation was offered and this person was saved saved from his disease, saved from a life of brokenness. Now, Naaman's condition was pretty desperate. He had no hope. Leprosy in that day was, you're, you're done, you're out. You're, go find a, a place to rest and wait it out because you're dead, you're living dead. And the offer of health comes to Naaman was too simple. So this, this offer of salvation for Naaman to be saved, his life saved, came from a servant, a servant, an Israeli servant, no less, and a girl. I mean, there couldn't be more of a bigger setup here to break his pride than this one. A servant girl was going to tell him how he can be saved, how he can be healed, how he can be made whole again. You see, no, no. Naaman's deal is that's too easy. That's too simple. What must I do? What must you expect from me? And so Naaman made a pilgrimage all the way to this prophet in Israel. And he, and he gave, wanted to give him all that he had brought. So, so at least come to the door and face him. This is an epic visit. This is, this is groundbreaking. This is a state visit, if you will. But Elisha had his representatives go and sort it out. And it's interesting that Naaman's response was like a slap in the face. What? Do you know who I am? I'm a commander in the army uh, of Syria. Come out to the door at least. And his advisors, it says, his advisors actually used this argument to convince him. Wouldn't you do something great? Then why don't you do something small? Will you do something amazing? Then why don't you do something simple to be saved? The offer of health was beneath him. <laughs> this offer of health was far beneath Naaman. He couldn't accept it. The high royal official with the entourage, with the chariots and the horses, at least come out to the at least come to a window and look at him. Face him, let alone require him to go into this dirty river. And it is kind of a dirty river. 
I'm not sure I would have done it, to be honest with you. We already established that I'm a prideful man because I wear my backpack on either arm. And there's other things. I'm not sure if I would have done this, going and climbed in this dirty river, when I have rivers back home that could have sufficed. Because it's humbling. And it's embarrassing. He had brought roughly, roughly, 750 pounds of silver, not ounces, pounds, 150 pounds of gold, 10 sets of clothing. He had brought a lot for for this event to happen. He was prepared to do what he needed to do to get healed, to get whole. But this was far too much. This was way too much because it was way too little. He had brought all this and this wasn't enough. He was asked to do something very small, very little, very simple. He had considered the cost and he had come prepared for the cost to be great. He had not considered this cost. He had not considered it would be this affordable, the cost of his pride. This is something that we all face at certain points in our lives. The cost means I have to lay down my pride. That's a great cost. It would cost him nothing in material terms and everything in personal terms. Everything in his own personal value and esteem terms. It would cost him there. And it took some convincing to get him into that water. We are like Naaman more than we care to admit, I think. Through an amazing glorious gift of God, we see our need, we see our, our spiritual sickness, if you will. We, we realize that we're in need of salvation. We can't make this life better or turn out right, or we can't free ourselves from the heaviness we feel. We can't free ourselves from the sins we feel guilty of committing. We can't do those things, and sometimes we try. Oh, sometimes we do try, and we become the deal-making men. We want to make a deal with God. God, if you can just help my life be better and lift this pain from me, I'll go to church more often. I'll be a better Christian. I'll give more. I'll, I'll change some of my habits if you want me to, Lord. But I'll, I will try these things. If you can lift some of this hurt, this pain from me, when all God wants is our hearts. He just wants our hearts. When all he asks for is an honest, legitimate relationship, a connection. No, 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 no. That's too easy. That's too simple, we say. Simple? Oh, yeah, it is simple. Easy? Not on your life. Not on your life. Is it simple for us to lay down our pride? Lay it down on the floor, to lay it right down. The simple ways of God are rarely easy because they poke to the heart of our beings. And in our humanness, we see his call as bizarre. What? What? Let me into your heart. What? Well, what kind of a call is that? What kind of a request is that? Let me into your heart. Admit me into your heart. Ask me to forgive you of your sins. Let me take them from you. Let me take them off of you. He might, have, he might as well have said, go into this dirty river seven times and dunk yourself, and you'll be saved. Because many of us wouldn't do that. It's still the way of humility. It's still through the door of humility because it neutralizes our pride over our ability to control our own lives and make life come from us. We always are doing this. We're always trying to make life come from us. We want to be in life. We want to live in a good life. And we try to create a life that has meaning. But unless there's something that happens on the inside, it doesn't have meaning regardless of all the stuff we have, regardless of our family, whatever. Because it's inside of us that the problem is, and the problem is our pride, and we won't lay it down. That's always the heart of the incident. Naaman's pride, our pride. And, and it's also the reason why some people have more trouble with this than others, right? Jesus was always talking about the poor. They have ears to hear. It's the rich ones who don't always have the ears to hear. In gender, many ways, men have a harder time than this. You know how hard it is to stop and ask for directions? It's just the thing. We we have, this is a challenge for us, guys. And it's not just gender-based. 
We guys have trouble with this because it means laying down our pride. And that's a tough one. Strong pride for us, ego. Uh, If something doesn't work and we need to make it work, we will add more power. We will ramp it up. We will increase it. We'll build it bigger to make it work because we need to make this thing work. We say, what must I do, Lord? What must I do? Didn't they say that to Peter? What must we do? What must I do to be saved, to be free? What must I do? Isn't there an entrance fee? Isn't there a cost associated? Yes, but it was paid in full by Jesus. In fact, we will go to great lengths not to embarrass ourselves in his presence. um, Because that's kind of how we operate as human beings. We will try to deal with the problems in our lives before we go to him. How many times have I talked to people who are going to stop smoking before they come to God? Because once they come to God, they will have to stop smoking, I guess. Or drinking. I've heard that one as well. I'll, st- I'll try to stop drinking before I come to God, and then it'll all be good. Thinking that when we've got it beat, we will be real followers of his. But friends, if we can beat those things, we don't need him. What's the point of God? You're not going to give your heart to him after you beat those things yourselves. We think when we've got it all beat, we will be real followers of God's, and we are fools to do this. We need him to help us with these things today, to help us with these challenges and these troubles and this inner heartbreak. We need him to help us with that stuff today. And it's pride that makes us want to do this ourselves. It's pride that makes us want to get healed ourselves. I'm not getting in that dirty water. Not on your life am I getting in there. And Jesus says to us, invite me in. Let me come in. I'm standing at the door. I'm knocking. Let me come in to you and we'll we'll fellowship with you and I'll forgive your sins and I'll forgive your failures. Let me heal you. Humble yourself. Humble yourself. Go to the river and dunk yourself seven times. Ask God for help and admit your pride and lay down the pride Let me heal you, God says. Humble yourself. Why? Because grace falls on the humble. It does not fall on the proud. There is no grace left for those who will be proud. James tells us that. God gives uh, grace to the ones who are humble. It might seem bizarre to you, but to submit to God, to invite him into your life, to ask him to wash it inside, to cleanse it, To ask him to forgive you is sometimes like getting in the dirty water and dunking yourself seven times. But you will come out with a heart as healthy as a young child's. This isn't easy, but it is simple. Simple. Humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up, scripture says. God would like to lift you up today and hold you close and heal you of your diseases. Sometimes I don't want to admit I need to talk with a counselor. Sometimes I don't want to admit I need help with this or that area of my life. And I want to get on with life. Well, it is simple, but it's not easy. Jesus said the path is narrow for those people who will lay down their pride. The path is wide for those who don't. Perhaps that's another reason why Jesus said we got to come to him as a child. So if God's been after you about some things in your life, listen to him. Listen to him. Don't be afraid of embarrassment. Let's not be full of pride. Let's be ready to ask for help in those troubling crises. And to end, this amazingly simple act of healing opened up Naaman's theological eyes. At the end of the passage, we read some interesting things. Naaman asked, could I take with me some dirt, two donkeys full of dirt? And we go, wow, what's that about? It's because Israel was Yahweh's God. I mean, Yahweh was Israel's God, that's better said. And God in that place in that time was territorial, okay? He belonged to countries and nations. So the ground that Naaman wanted to take home was holy ground. It was God's ground. It was ground where God dwelt. God, Yahweh, would dwell. Because Naaman was humbled. He just wanted to take God's dirt back home. This was humility, friends. This was true humility. He learned some lessons in that water. Coming to God humbly 
giving up his pride, will make us do strange and simple things. Let's pray. Lord, just remind us of this this week when we start to move into places of defense where we say, nah, I don't want to do that. Then let us ask ourselves why. Help us to catch ourselves when it turns out to be more about how I look in the world or how I look to myself or my family. Help, help us not to live at that place, but to live in the place of humility and openness and to get into that dirty water where life is for us because it means the death of our pride. Lord, would you help each of us as we struggle with this deep thing that's human, that's in all of us, that's a challenge for all of us, Lord. Help us put that thing to death with the power of Jesus. Amen. Stand with us. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord bless you. It has been good to worship with you this morning and hear updates from the world and right here in our own community. We'll be praying for you. Pray for us this week. And as you go and wrestle with this thing called pride, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace this day and the days that are to follow. Go now in that peace. You're all invited downstairs for some fellowship. We'll see you there. Mm -hmm.